I am excited to have this chat. I am going to give a few quick announcements before we jump into it and we'll wait like another minute just to make sure that we've got the critical mass and everybody's here and then we can get going. But this is very cool to see. This is our inaugural event. So yes, very, it's really very cool. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I, this is this is like uh, you know, coming waking up on Christmas morning. You get to open <laughs> all your presents. <laughs> well, what's amazing to me is like this is fast. I mean, we talked about this what just a few weeks ago. Yeah. And here we are. Here we are doing it. So we don't mess around. We're doing yeah, this. man. This is not we don't mess around. That's exactly it. No messing yeah. around now. The um let me see here. I'm well, you know, share. I don't usually test my code unless I put it in production first. So this kind of works for me. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> exactly that. I'm going to just uh, mention in case anyone is not in there already, we have a yeah. Slack channel. And the idea of the Slack channel, I just threw the invite link in the group um, in the chat. There, what I would love to happen and I think the whole goal of it is that we can create a space, a common space for all of us who are going through different problems around doing data on Kubernetes. And if you need to ask for help, we can have people there that hopefully have gone through the same problems and can help you. Or if you're one of those people that just has already hit their head against the wall a thousand times and knows how to do something because you've gone through it the hard way, then maybe you can reach out and help others who don't need to hit their head against the wall a thousand times. So really, um, we'll have it be a, uh, I'll share it again in the chat so that you can check it out, but we'll have it be a place like a knowledge hub for doing data on Kubernetes. And that leads nicely into what exactly we are doing here today and what is this whole data on Kubernetes community about. And really, I think that after talking to a bunch of people, you, Patrick included, we've come to the consensus that there is a lot of really cool stuff happening on Kubernetes, which we know about. It's one, it's the, the future. And then there's other places where things have felt like they've been a little forgotten. And we feel like data on Kubernetes is one of those. And I think that your talk today will sum up this whole idea, this vision of, hey, is it ready or do we need to talk more about this? Do we need to advance the space more? And hopefully what we can do here, you know, this is a very vendor neutral community. Everyone is welcome. Anyone, whatever you're doing, you're welcome here. And so that we can all make it more mature as far as doing data on Kubernetes. So that's my pitch, if we could say. I am very happy to announce this is our inaugural meetup. And we're going to be doing these every week on Tuesday at this time, 9 a.m., in California, 5 p.m. in London. So stay tuned. And if anyone wants to talk about anything specific, please reach out to me on Slack or um, send me an email. But without further ado, I think we can get into it. Huh? <laughs> Did that, we'll hopefully it. That, that summed everything up. All right, so Patrick, if nobody can see it right now, you are the VP of Developer Relations at Datastax. Today you told me you are going to talk or we are going to talk about if Kubernetes is even ready for data. And I've got a bunch of questions prepared. I want to ask you a bunch of stuff about this because yeah. <laughs> like you said, you want to keep it controversial. It's never, never fun if it's just falling oh. in line. Yeah, just do git clone and you're good, right? That's all. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's not what we're here for. That's, That's not, not it for. at all. <laughs> so, so yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. But before we even dive into any of that, I'd love to just start with finding out how you got into technology and where your background, where you're coming from. 
oh my god <laughs> oh my god <laughs> where did i come from oh <laughs> man <laughs> well not so philosophical but you know you can yeah. keep it light just yeah no it's it, i've been working in so i actually my degree is in computer engineering with distributed computing so this has been my my formal career has been around distributed computing but um along the way this dot-com thing happened in the 90s and it was freaking awesome and so i started learning how to scale databases to like hundreds of people it was great <laughs> and <laughs> um when the when the dot crash happened and you know we, we all said oh wait a minute let's do that again this time the right way i i was involved in infrastructure pretty early there and um i ran my own consulting company which basically was like how do i all these companies were trying to figure out. It was that first wave of digital transformation where everyone was like, okay, we, we everyone had a web page back in the 90s. Now we're actually gonna try to do commerce. And it got more, way more interesting in those early 2000s. And I was involved in a lot of stuff. Um, I think I had some of the first instances on EC2 on AWS um, because a friend of mine was working on that team. Wow. And yeah, it was really cool. Um, but you know that's when I got involved in um, declarative infrastructure. Uh, early days, you know, of course, were Bash scripts and Perl. <laughs> but you know, Chef came along, um, Puppet. Um, I was a I was really uh, into Chef. But um, along that you know that journey, as I'm scaling infrastructure like crazy, um, I started you know my background in databases and and distributed infrastructure got me really involved in the Cassandra project. Um, the first time I tried it, I was like, this is the database for me. So that's what I've been doing for the past 10 years. <laughs> nice. Nice. A worthy way to spend your time, right? It's, it's a great project. And so I'm wondering, how then did you start getting into Kubernetes? And how, how long have you been like, doing things around Kubernetes? Yeah, so the Kubernetes isn't, so, if you're doing anything scale infrastructure, you can't not run into Kubernetes everywhere. And I remember early days of Kubernetes, this is like five, six years ago. Um, I think it was back that far. Um, you know, we were, we were exploring how we work with Kubernetes, mainly because the Cassandra project was trying to work with containers mostly. You know, and that was, and containers at that time were still pretty, we were working on making containers work really well with databases. Because if you recall, that was the discussion. Like, are containers ready for databases? And the answer was kind of no, um, because of the way that it did networking and, and IO. Um, they just were, you know, they, you can't expect performance out of the container. So um, as we're, I was working with a lot of folks in the Docker community to try to make that better. And it was quickly, you know, we realized that Docker Compose is not the way to make this work. And um, we did some really cool stuff with Terraform. Um, I mean, Terraform is still really cool. I like Terraform. But um, Kubernetes became, it started popping up in really interesting places. And I say interesting because they were doing scale work at, and that's when I started getting involved with operators. Uh, and trying to understand the darkest intricacies of Kubernetes networking, um, which took me back to like my, Ooh. yeah, my Cisco IOS days. Um, <laughs> did I actually de declare a, a BGP route? <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> um, but it was, I mean, it was just part of that. And the, probably in the past year, I've been really involved with it because it's been become clear that because um, I was also working at Mesos at the time. So just really anything to help me get, you know, scale infrastructure out there. And, and that was, you know, just a few years ago. Now here we are. Kubernetes is the winner. <laughs> yeah. 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 And the conversation has evolved, right? It's gone from, like you said, is, like, can we do these containers with databases? And now we're ha talking about this. Um, yeah. And I mean, and this year I joined the CNCF TOC. So that's been pretty interesting. Um, I get a, I get all the emails whenever everything goes into sandbox. <laughs> and it's just a really vibrant uh, ecosystem and community. Yeah, I think that's, that also draws a lot of people to it, for sure. So a bit of a, a question on this. How have you seen it evolve over time? And how, how, Kubernetes, I mean, how have you seen Kubernetes evolve? And especially with respect to doing data? Yeah, that this is where this is where my main beef lies is, and it's not a beef. It's just okay. I'm I'm calling it out. 
All right, everyone, I'm, I'm, I'm calling a timeout. <laughs> and it's, I think it's because in the early, uh, you know, early part of when we really started to scale hard, and that was like in the 2005, 2010 realm, that's when NoSQL took off. You know, it's when we realized relational databases aren't gonna scale the way we want, and we started working on that problem pretty hard. And um, so that took off, you know, that, that went, and you see, that the result of that is what you have today in distributed databases. But meanwhile, there was another, I think there was a parallel universe of application infrastructure and that's where Kubernetes was. And um, the DevOps crowd slowly migrated to being Kubernetes. But what I saw, what I have seen is that there was a, there's just been this parallel path where we figured out scale data and we figured out scale infrastructure for applications. But what we've done is we've built Kubernetes basically as a, as a massive app server. And um, it will connect to other things, but they just have not really been living in the same ecosystem. So um, they both work, they both scale, they both do what they need to do, but they're just not, they're just not really talking well together. And, they're not, and there's just not a lot of alignment there, um, which I think is where we're sitting in 2020. I mean, here we are, um, and it's a massive opportunity to start converging things. Yeah, that's a great point. And obviously the, the next question is that I'm sure a lot of people have is, well, how can we change that, right? And how do you see us moving forward with that? Yeah, this, uh, <laughs> this is the other controversial thing. I don't think it's operators. <laughs> um, <laughs> operators are fantastic for what they do. I would say Kubernetes success was kind of hinging on the fact that operators exist. and because it gave, it gave everyone a flexibility to bring their own thing into this Kubernetes ecosystem, which is fantastic. Um, I, I work with a Cassandra project on the Cassandra operator, and it is, it is the only way you're gonna run Cassandra in Kubernetes is with an operator. But I mean, if you look at the explosion of operators and just the craziness that's happening in operator land right now, it's like now there's operators for operators. Like we're starting to divulge, uh, all the cracks, here it is. Okay, well, I can't just deploy an, an operator. I have to have an operator of operators. <laughs> and um, it's, and I think it's because we've gotten away from the, what were the core tenets of Kubernetes. And like, as I, as I look at the code and I study what, what was started, um, it was built on these primitives and the primitives have nothing to do with data. Okay, interesting. I'm just dropping that on there. To yeah. <laughs> 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 I love it. I love it. And so I, I'd like to kind of gauge where we're at with everyone in the chat. If somebody or if anybody wants to throw in there, if you're doing data on Kubernetes and your how you're doing it, just you can even just put like a yes, I'm doing it or no, or want to future initiative. Um, but yeah, <laughs> let us know in the in the chat because I just want to gauge where we're at with everyone that's listening. And so the next question that I had a hand was, up. yeah, we got, we got a hand up. I guess that might be question or it might be, I'm doing it. I'm uh, doing it. I think know. you were asking. Yeah. Are yeah. you doing it? Doing it. You're doing it. He's <laughs> doing it for sure. Devo. I, I think Devo is definitely doing it. I, I get the feeling. So mm -hmm. now i um, trying to think about this operator question and, and one of my, one of my questions that I had before you planned was like, who operates the operators <laughs> and how do you well, select what's them? What's behind that question? <laughs> <laughs> it's like so many operators, right? Like how do you select them? Who runs them? Does that depend on whether they're a workload infrastructure or other operators? Like just shedding some light on that. But I get the feeling that you don't even, you don't even want to talk about operators. You want to talk, you want to go down a different road. Is that well, no, right? we can talk about operators because that's that's the state of the art. Um, okay. What I want to talk about is you know, moving on, and uh. that's, that's the exciting part. You know, like I said, we're not just doing a Git clone here. We're talking. Yeah, about <laughs> yeah, exactly. The vision, the vision, the vision that we have. So, what do you feel would be like? Basically, building off of your last answer when I asked you, like, how can we do this? How do you feel like? we can run Cassandra on Kubernetes the right way. Like what needs to be done? Is it truly possible at this time or 
is there still like what kind of gap do we have a lot of questions i'm throwing at you so just feel free to go one by one yeah well let's let's pick through the what's the state of the state of the art what do you get today like with an operator uh what you're getting is is the you're getting the uh, the shim layer between kubernetes and cassandra uh, we'll talk about Cassandra specifically because that's that's the one I'm the most involved in, but it has plenty of parallels for every other thing in the universe. So don't worry. Um, Cassandra, you know, is is a distributed database, and it has its own notion of replication. For instance, um, like when you when you deploy a bare metal Cassandra cluster, it manages its own replication, placement, all that stuff, and data placement. Um, the Kubernetes replication controller has its own ideas. Like, oh, no, no, pod, you're going over here because, you know, that's the way I see it. So the operator that was built for Cassandra actually mitigates some of that discussion. It saves Cassandra from what Kubernetes wants to do. For instance, you could bury yourself pretty bad. It, Kubernetes is not aware of data placement, not even thinking about it. It's like, oh, you want, you want a pod? Got it. You run over there. It could stack up a bunch of Cassandra nodes on a single piece of hardware somewhere and you wouldn't even know it. And that's a huge anti-pattern because let's say the power goes out and you're on that one honking machine you got. Well, what's going to happen? You're going to lose a significant amount of your Cassandra cluster uh, not even knowing like what just happened. I mean, a quarter of my cluster just blinked out. And it's just because, and it's not any fault other than it's just a default behavior, Kubernetes. So the operator's job partially is to when kubernetes is like i'm gonna save you the operator's like sure dude and then it's like here's what we're really gonna do to the rest of the cluster and then to move stuff around it's like we got it and so everyone's happy right <laughs> um and you know that that works it works really well um but uh, you know that's what you're doing though is you're building technical debt into an operator and i i think that's the kind of the thing that i see a lot in operators is you're taking a thing that was built in one way and probably built well and trying to translate into what Kubernetes wants to do, which is also built well, but you're building technical debt because there's now a parity mismatch. And I think that's, that's, you know, answer question number one. <laughs> let's, there, let's, let's get to that part first. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, so like in your eyes, biggest obstacle to running, Cassandra on Kubernetes would be this whole idea of like just building technical debt with the operators. Yeah, it, well, it, it yes, and uh, it, there's some really cool projects like the Kudo project. I don't know if you know the Kudo Kudo project. Not yeah, Kudo Kudo, um, where they're trying to make boilerplate basically for operators, and I think that's a really good idea for um, when you bring your thing to Kubernetes. You don't need to go through a lot of uh, cycles to build a complete operator. Um, you provide a CRD and it, it basically compiles you a nice operator, which is pretty cool, right? Um, but it is it, it skips like some of the stuff that you may need in a more complicated system. Mm. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So back to that uh, five in one question. How yeah. far? You want to unravel that a little? Yeah. <laughs> I got I got four more of those questions that you didn't answer. You just answered the first one. So yeah. <laughs> now, going back to that, really, I think what I'm really interested in is your thoughts on how far away we are from doing it right. Oh yeah, that's oh, okay. I gotta like this is being recorded, so I'll probably have to make a good call. And it's going out on YouTube. Forever. Going on YouTube, yeah. I mean, realistically, we're years away from it being done right, which is fine. Um, I think we'll have we'll have incremental steps of doing it right, and it'll change. Um, but I think the fact that we're having this conversation, the fact that you created this community, means that we have a, a group of engineers that are super excited of doing it right, and so mm. it, it's going to be a thing uh, over years, and it probably will take a long time for it to be settled and we'll move on to the next thing and you'll create a new community for the next thing. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Yep. <laughs> just making communities all over the place. So, <laughs> like, <"Yeah." laughs> they just pop up like mushrooms. So, <laughs> so I, I want to be uh, conscientious because I see Dean is asking some questions here in the chat. Yeah. This is an awesome question. 
He's saying as an experienced IT infrastructure salesperson for the past 20 years, what he's been seeing a lot of is companies that are older than five or 10 years old still have this mainframe, CI, HCI, VMware, public cloud, all within their IT real estate. Everyone it hungers for a solution to span all of them and Kubernetes at a high level does that. Also, DevOps has always been a contentious issue for organizations in Kubernetes forces, a mechanism to alleviate that contention. And he's wondering if you have any thoughts on it. He's also putting like, um, he sees that Kubernetes for data provides a mechanism for mature organizations and ability to move their data to where the workloads need to be, while at the same time maintain data sovereignty to allow these same organizations to process that data inf into information that can lead to better products. Whew. All right. Uh, thanks, Dean. Lots of unpack short, there. Short question, yeah. <laughs> um, well, sure. I mean, I, the let's let's try to like condense that down into terms that... I think Dean used. heard me ask the five-part question. He just jumped on the bandwagon and he just said yeah what about so, that <laughs> i'm with you dean i like it i really appreciate it just uh so don't stop asking the questions because we'll just throw them all at patrick and let him have to deal with it that idea you guys are uh, that's great it's like a tag team wrestling match it's fantastic <laughs> we should just get him in the panel let's go <laughs> yeah, i'm gonna put um, i'm gonna put your video on dean <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know i'm perfectly happy to answer all these questions um because this is i think i'm gonna glue a term on here that it seems kind of markety but it's really what we're doing is this digital transformation um it, this is a great example of like what's driving the change and it let's let's remove the marketing term digital transformation Let, let's get down what it is we don't want amazon eating our lunch that's the problem mm. right and companies that are making this switch and i agree um if you're running your business off a of mainframe and you're competing with amazon you better have a plan you know that um that's what's happened to companies like walmart and target um you know and and even like Sky UK. I mean, I work with Sky uh, quite a bit on K Kubernetes projects and, you know, they know who they're competing with. They're competing with Netflix. They're completing, you know, the new kids on the block. Um, they're not just a satellite in a satellite TV provider. Oh no. You know, they're stream, they have massive IT streaming operations. So that's digital transformation. And um, I agree. I think that uh, Kubernetes is a key part of that because if you're going to move from one state to another so if you're going from kubernetes or from a, your mainframe or running um maybe some old school monolith java application or something you're going to want to migrate it into something more modernized um the thing about kubernetes and i think this is where people um, have decided that this is the right choice is it gives you a certain amount of portability which is really key if i run kubernetes in my infrastructure in my data center um that I can run it just as well in Google or in Amazon or anywhere. It's pretty portable at that point. And um, that was kind of the move by Google by making Kubernetes a project it was like, we need to make infrastructure portable. Um, and remember how Amazon was just like kicking and screaming the whole way. No Kubernetes, I hate it. <laughs> and it's like, but we have all this other stuff. Cloud formation is greater. It's better or no, it isn't. And then finally, they're just like, like one, it was one reinvent. It was like, poor, you know, the, 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 the announcement. All right, we're doing Kubernetes now. What? What? <laughs> we're doing Kubernetes. <laughs> so now here it is. You know, we have EKS. Um, and that, you mentioned VM, like VMware. VMware has Tanzu. Tanzu is a hybrid cloud solution. It's meant to run Kubernetes anywhere. Um, Hey, wake up. 2020 is awesome if you want to run infrastructure because now you have choice. Yeah, at least in some things, 2020 is being awesome. You know, come on. One thing. Let's just let's, uh, let's look at the bright side here, man. Yep. <laughs> Can we have one thing? <laughs> <laughs> so I know that you are, you still stay pretty close to the code. And I, I wanted to ask this one real fast before I ask you another paragraph question. Do you got any war stories for us um, about when shit hit the fan? 
Oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe in the past month, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> past month, I mean, uh, let's narrow it down in infrastructure or in a shipping product. <laughs> Ooh, good one. Let's start with infrastructure. Um, yeah, infrastructure. Uh, so here's a funny data story about it, when she hits a fan when it, when it comes to code is, um, and I'd say this a lot, is the only time I've ever restored a database is because of a programmer. Um, there was a particular push that we did that um, somebody did a ninja commit and it wasn't me I didn't do it somebody did a ninja commit and but I had to fix it um, there was a ninja commit on these uh, regular expression validator for an email address on a piece of e-commerce product we had and um, funny thing about regex is not everyone knows how to make them work right and uh, that's exactly what happened. So what happened was we pushed this code into production and it looked at every single email address that saw and said, well, that's not valid and deleted it from the database. That was the code. If oh. not valid, delete. So we spent the next two days cherry picking database backups, trying to find email addresses for the 60,000 email addresses that got deleted within two hours. Oh. Yeah. So that whole thing of I don't usually test my code unless it's in production, kind of true. <laughs> uh, yeah. How about Ouch. that one? Yeah, is that a good one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. That one yeah. makes me pause and think real fast. <laughs> well, you know, and, and I, I bring that up often because, you know, backups, backing up your data is not about hardware failure. It's not. It's not maintaining a state of where you're sitting. <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right. Well, all right. Back yeah. to that. <laughs> yeah. Now that I'm really uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's where you wanted to take it. All right. I, I guess I asked the question. I'll take you part did. blame for that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, let's get back to these. Like, because I was reading some blog posts from you, and one of the the questions that I had was I saw there was a quote, and I'll put it in the chat because. I, it's a long one and maybe a lot of people don't want quote. to hear me read it. Um, basically it was, it's saying like, if you have a hundred cluster environment, you provision the data store that can handle that level of traffic, but then your Kubernetes scales down, data doesn't scale with it. That's provisioning into the Kubernetes environment. And my sense is that that's where a lot of technologies are playing today. The challenge is, what is the data environment that scales out with Kubernetes, scales in with Kubernetes, rides along with Kubernetes? That hasn't really been done well, and it's an incredibly difficult to do. And so I'm wondering, I think with, with Cassandra- and in, fair, in fairness, yeah. the, that was not my quote. That was uh, my <laughs> colleague, Sam Ramji. I just noticed that <laughs> this is Sam's quote, but I'm, he and I talk all the time about this, so I'm more than happy to defend his quote. <laughs> all right, there we go. All right, yeah, Sam, if you want to come on here and get grilled too, you're more than welcome. He um, will. But he will. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so can you explain what's happening there in a bit more depth and why it's so cool? Yeah, well, I mean, and so the scale out and scale in you know, it sounds cool, but scale out is easy. Actually, we fi we figured out that e that that problem pretty well. Um, but scaling in and the the elastic, you know, we were having this argument the other day. I was like, what's what's the difference between scale and elastic? This is the same thing, right? No, they're not. Um, I can make a lot of things scale, but it's really difficult to make things elastic. Meaning, I can. I can add more CPU, I can add more disk to a system, and make it go up. But removing those systems is really difficult. And so, um, you know, when we talk about connections with Kubernetes, yeah, we, we, want, we want it to stick with, I'm, I'm, I'm actually adding to the quote that Sam put in there, but like we want something to work as a team. So if I have two separate infrastructure setups, if I have my Cassandra cluster sitting over here and I have my Kubernetes cluster sitting over here, I've just created this duality that now I have to either have two sets of people operating them, like, you know, people, or I have to have double the knowledge where I just want to have one common set of knowledge. I want to go into kubectl, say, you know, scale and go up. Um, but we also wanted to look at the down 
too, because that's one of the things Kubernetes does really well is the, the elastic. It's like, I don't need 50 web servers anymore. I need 10 and, and it just says, got it. What about data? Really difficult to do. Yeah. So that's a, exactly what I was thinking along the lines of like, because uh, I had a question up here, how when we talked last time, you were telling me this idea of like, oh, there's a lot of things that Cassandra is doing and Kubernetes also does. And I think you mentioned before, like self-healing or things like that. And, um, and then you were saying like, it's just kind of playing on top of each other. And is it needed? How can you make those so they integrate nicer? Right. Yeah, let's talk about the way that, yeah, let's, let's talk about the future. It was like the way I would love to see it. So the way that the current state of way Cassandra and Kubernetes handle uh, like a, a node loss, that's what we would consider. Like, so Cassandra being a cluster database, each node is a shared nothing architecture and you could lose a node in production. You're fine. It's, it, you know, that's one of the great things about Cassandra is it'll take a beating and keep on ticking. Um, but uh, when that event happens, let's say you have some sort of a hardware failure. Um, the way Kubernetes sees it is, oh, nodes out, create a new one, fix that. Okay, restore the state. Okay, that's all it really wants to do. Cassandra's point of view is much different. It's like, no, 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 there was, um, there was a, that node stored a certain state of the, a piece of the cluster. So it is a little more than just you know, just a random node, it has some piece of data and a token range assigned to it. So if I'm going to bring back a new node, I either need to reassign the token range or just bring it back with the storage that was attached to it. So this is a great thing about like attached storage is you can just bring up a node, attach the storage and it's fine. And it's like, oh, where was I? It was like, just knocked out for a little bit. Um, so Cassandra, feels that a node out is more of an ephemeral operation and not a final, like just kill it with fire and replace it. Um, so when you have this mismatch, um, this is one of the things that I, ha I feel like we have an opportunity to do. Like the state management Kubernetes, state management in Kubernetes could be fully aware of data services like that and be much more uh, relaxed about how it, like, and, and more informed. Now, right now we're using the operator, <clears throat> but there's more than just Cassandra that has this, this same issue. Uh, Kafka has the same thing too. Mm. So if Kubernetes state management was a little more, um, was smarter about, oh, this is a system that has, and it's not, and stateful sets are not the answer. Um, that, is a, that is yet another thing that we added along the way to hopefully fix it. But yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, we could, I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting thing we could work on as a community in Kubernetes. And so what else do you feel Cassandra does and it should be done by Kubernetes or Kubernetes does and Cassandra does better that maybe it's um, what like retry logic or disk provisioning with the help of other tools like OpenEBS or or just nothing at all? Do you feel like that's the only area that it could be bettered? Uh, well, two, two, two areas that I focus on right now are, are network and, and storage. And <clears throat> so we'll talk about storage because I think that's a pretty interesting, like I've been talking to the, the folks over at OpenEBS and my data and um, there's some really, uh, I think this is a group think like, okay, the way storage works right now with Kubernetes um, is you know, it's fairly, it's ephemeral if you're using something like a container, but then we created the stateful sets and pervis, uh, persistent volume claims and things like that to make it so that we can glue storage into a, into a node. Okay. So that, that's good. But <clears throat> so when you, when you fire up your pod and you, you know, you have your storage, you declare it, but there's no, there's no, nothing about the quality of the storage. There's nothing about like, there's nothing simple about it either. I mean, if you if you are creating when you look at the uh, YAML file you do to create a Cassandra cluster, like a good chunk of it is just setting up the storage, and you better understand it, and you're probably going to get it wrong the first time. And that's a that's a real cry for There's help. There's some in inspiration book. for you all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I I really do think that like as we have storage classes that are inside of a CRD, 
we should have a storage class for data storage. It's a certain type of storage and it, and it comes with the things that we want for data storage. Like um, it does the, the right quality of service. It does things like um, you can put in things like snapshotting, um, how it, uh, it manages the, like the connection like, you know, it's, it's like a stateful set, except if it was just built into the way that the state of Kubernetes was, instead of a stateful set where you do a declarative, you just make that the, I need data storage of this size and of this quality, and I need a snapshot at every hour. Boom, put that in my YAML file and then be done with it. Yeah, and it's so interesting you mentioned that because mm -hmm. next week I'm gonna be talking with Zach from Optoro. Uh, same place, same time for everybody that is listening out there. And he was saying, like, he was echoing that same exact sentiment. Like, why can't it be that easy? Right? What's going on That's right it. now? That's it. That, when I, so I, I work with a complicated distributed system. And I, I was, when I look at Kubernetes, I'm like, boy, we just never learned our lesson ever. We, we just love making things super complicated. And I get it, we're all engineers. I mean, like, I'm not afraid of a YAML file. I mean, a space could break my whole deployment. Sure, sign me up. But, you know, it's like that, that is not going to work well in the long term. Um, you know, how many of you use SendMail? You know, the great thing about SendMail is it's really configurable. The bad thing about SendMail is it's really configurable. <laughs> <laughs> we, need to, we need to get a little closer to, you know, where people can just pick it up and run with it really quickly. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think a lot of people out there also have that same feeling. No. Oh, I got a nailed it in the quote. <laughs> Yes. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so along those lines, I see Dean mentioning something. It's not really a, a question, but it is a great uh, thing to to mention. And he's talking about how storage has basically been treated the same way over eons and eons. And it's interesting to think about that as data these days especially is really the most important thing about a business's IT strategy. So I could, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, that, back to my point about, you know, my, my, my terrible story. If someone deployed some code that threw up an, an exception when the, a user showed up, I would have been like, Oh, we got to fix that. But the fact that it deleted data, turn it into a massive 911 in the entire organization where like the CEO was getting involved. Uh -oh. Let's crock that for a second. Data seems important. <laughs> and losing it, not good. That's a career ending event. <laughs> yeah, or a company ending event. Yeah, 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 that's so, not good. Yeah, that, <laughs> thanks I for didn't want to go, it. Brr, I got a little <laughs> cold in here, but that's okay. <laughs> We're getting heated yeah, up with exactly. some Kubernetes love. Uh, you had to remind <laughs> us about that story again, huh? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's um, let's talk about some best practices that you found over the years of running Cassandra on Kubernetes. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. how, what do you feel are some things that we could, like actionable steps that we could take right now just to doing it better? Um. Well, it's funny, uh, Gabrielle asked in the, in the chat, what do you think about LPPs? <laughs> um, <laughs> LPPs are awesome, because <laughs> that means you're getting closer to the metal, and which makes mm. your database happier. Um, and I think it's a, good, it's a good first step. Here's what I don't want to see happen, is running, uh, running like Cassandra running NFS is <laughs> a recipe for disaster, because NFS is just this high latency, snaky, Kind of like, oh, well, if you want to store your pictures or your cat, it's awesome. But it's not for a database, right? Um, so, uh, you know, the, one of the early, like, when we go back to all the advice that's ever been given for databases running in clouds and virtual machines, anything, is um, the closer you get your IOs closer to bare metal, the better. Because that's, that's basically the speed of your system. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the current state right now, running, um, LPV or at least provisioning um, storage like using like an Amazon um, uh, you know the GP2 is really great on Elastic Cloud Block Storage EBS um, 
Google has a lot of really cool shared storage options, but all those storage options are gonna be performance. What's the lowest latency with the highest throughput? Read and write. It's not just read, it's not just write, it's both. And you know that, I go back to what Dean said, it's like it took us a while to, I, I actually was in a meeting with Amazon years ago to, to, to explain to them why they needed to have that. Like they were like, well, EBS works great. Why are you having a problem with this? I'm like, it needs to have high throughput, read and write. And it took a while. Luckily I knew some people on the EBS team and they were also fans of Cassandra and we got GP2 almost, it, it pretty much happened because of Cassandra. So you were able to throw your weight around? Not, I was just able to form a good argument. <laughs> you know, there's money over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but I mean, it, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm answering the question or not, but I saw Gabriel's question, uh, question in the uh, Slack or in the chat channel. And yeah, so that's, I mean, to boil that down, the closer you get to bare metal, the better. And that is one of your best practices. Do you have any others that you've seen? Um, with storage in particular, um, yes. Uh, make sure you can snapshot your volumes. Um, that's another. I think that's the backup of the of the current generation of databases is snapshotting. Mm. Having a good snapshot um, strategy, because we're using a lot of immutable files now in data storage. Um, snapshotting can get you up and running a lot faster then you know streaming backups are so 1995 you know don't do that yeah <laughs> i couldn't agree with you more on the snapshots that's it's such a good point <laughs> yeah um, uh, yeah we didn't talk about networking yet by the way we need yeah to, yeah let's get into it let's, let's talk, talk about, about it. that yeah <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't have any questions specific about it so I'm going to let you just talk and Oh now we're going to riff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, I, this is uh this is another thing that I think is really critical to data infrastructure is how networking works. If you look at the way that Kubernetes is designed for networking, it's all kind of hinging around ingress and single IP that's load balanced in some way. Um it, and some of the really cool stuff that's happening in service mesh with Envoy, Istio, Kong, um, is starting to think about it a little differently. Like, oh, the, you know, like microservices need to be interconnected. That's great with storage, you know what I mean? With uh, storage, with security and, and things. Um, but I, I feel like we could level up there as well. Um, for instance, you know, Ingress as a first class citizen of Kubernetes is fantastic. But why don't we have anything that d deals with like the layers that connect to databases as well? It should just be a storage, I mean, a, a configuration that's in a part of Kubernetes state. If I'm like, I would like to connect to my data services. Please, please connect me with that. Instead of having to front load all this configuration into like, if I'm building microservices with something like Quarkus, um, I have to ex be explicit with my configuration. I can't go out and look for it. If I'm deploying a microservice into Kubernetes, um, it doesn't just automatically figure it out for me, which I think other things do. If I hook up an Nginx server, if I deploy an Nginx server, Ingress connects to it. I don't have to think about it. That makes it really awesome if I'm deploying an Nginx server, <laughs> but nothing for around that for databases yet. So how do you see that happening? How does <sighs> It's, How does that play a, out in your mind? Yeah, I think this is where we're going to have, this is where we all have to work together. Um, already in the, in the Cassandra project, we've been talking about how do we change Cassandra to be better with Kubernetes? That, that conversation is happening. Um, and, it's, and that's fine. I mean, we're not going to say, no, 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 you come here. Um, it's, it, we evolve together. And, but I think the Kubernetes project needs to have also a similar conversation. It's like, how do we, how do we move beyond just making connections to Web server is awesome. Um, and what does that mean? Sure. Yeah, um, and so do you see that being like in a SIG or do you see that? Yeah, there's, there, is a, there is a SIG right now um, that, well, there's the Kubernetes Federation SIG, which is kind of interesting. That's another one and another issue that like Kubernetes is considered itself, a, the cluster is an island. The, you will never leave this 
I mean, uh, anyone who's ever set up Kubernetes on a local system, no, but you really have to work hard to even get into it. You know, it's like, it really is like, no. <laughs> a barrier to entry. That's right. Yeah. It's like, oh, I got to set up a proxy. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, like distributed databases, like, well, and I'm thinking of things like Apache Pulsar, Cassandra, um, you know, there's a lot of flink. All these data products that are out there are multi data center. They they want to be in multiple clusters, and so that's just not a concept. And um, so there's a couple of projects that are really cool. Like KFed is interesting. Um, can we call it KFed? Are we friends yet? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that that's how do you make multiple because uh, Kubernetes clusters. Um, intercommunicate and create more of a pro like a, a configurable practice between that like VPNs how are you gonna do that okay so along those lines a bit like with the setup I was I had a question come to mind as far as what you're running Cassandra on and if there's such a big difference on whether you're running it on EKS or OpenShift, is it identical? Or when you're when you're setting those up, is there a big difference? How do you look at that? Like, are there tweaks required to run it on one versus the other? Yeah, and it's going to come down to whatever this, this the services you're purchasing in each place, right? So if you're at, let's say you're in JKE, JKE, G, oh man, Google. <laughs> there. I'm, I'm kind of acronymed out right now um or you're yeah, on EKS. <laughs> so you're running on amazon and google um when you set up those deployments they're gonna they are gonna be different because you're probably using different sets of services like storage is a good example um so i, I this is one of the things that i i'm like uh, i love the whole concept of GitOps. I, you know, and what that brings is like, I store my configuration in Git and I deploy it through my CI CD pipeline and eventually to production. Great. Except now we have all these, yeah, but, you know, when you get to Amazon, it's going to be, you're going to be using EBS. And when you go to Google, you're going to be using whatever persistent store you're going to use there, like attached volumes or something. And so there's, you're going to have, I'm, I'm really hoping we don't have like if blocks or macros <laughs> built in YAML files for our deployments. But, you know, I think that's a challenge we're going to have to do now. But best practice right now is you're going to have to have different, similar, but very different. And I think you can probably just part out the different YAML files to make that work right. Like here's your deployment for your database, but then here's my storage configuration for Amazon storage configuration for Google. Um, keep those separate, test those separately. Um, but, um, yeah, that that's you just have to keep in mind that that's a thing. So, and then do you see it eventually going to like one uniform, or is that just because of the nature of of the different providers that it's it's never going to play nice together? <laughs> now, let me ask you, man. Have you when have you ever seen anything get common in the cloud? <laughs> <laughs> or even I'm just thinking about like my iPhone charger. And how that's not the same. Why can't I have USB-C on my iPhone charger, right? And so, yeah, I guess I answered. I have my iPhone that. charger right here. And it's funny because like one side is USB-C and then the other side is, is the fire yeah. cable. Thing. Why is that? Why? So that cable is probably a, a, a really good example of, yeah, this is the way we're going to be. We're going to have shim layers. Um, I. I think that that may be where the Kubernetes community can come together on is by cr when you create something like data storage, is that, is that just, well, I, I have a certain class of storage and then the providers will, will show up with the proper store backend for mm. it. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Well, I think Ingress is trying to go that way. I've been watching the Ingress project quite a bit and I, they're trying to abstract you know, like, Oh God, are using F5 or Istio or, ELB on Amazon or what, what? It, it, no, I just need a load balanced IP. And <clears throat> I, I keep going back to data storage, but I think, you know, like thinking of abstraction layers where it's super simple for the operator, I, I should be able to deploy something in a one page YAML file or less. Yeah. 
That is the dream. It's a great dream. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. And that is why I wanted to have you on as our first guest, because I feel like if we can come together in this data on Kubernetes community, hopefully we can drive that change and we can try and make something that is a little less hairy when we are deploying or when we're putting together our YAML files. And so I- I'm looking forward to hearing all the different, I mean, I, I'm one point of view and you know, I'm just you know, that. And I'd love to hear, I'm looking forward to hearing how other people see things and where I'd love to hear different directions for the project that people may want to see. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I think that is going to be the whole collaborative nature of this community. Right. And so everybody that is coming on again, I mentioned it at the beginning, but if you would like to talk, you feel like, Hey, I got something to say around this. I've got my vision and I, I would like people to hear it. Please reach out to me directly in the Slack, which I will put another link to that in the chat if you are not already in it. And yeah, also like if you have initiatives that you want to create, we're gonna start doing a mini series on data security. We're going to start doing a lot of different things around data, but if you have something that you specifically would like to see done around this. I, I think another mini series that would be incredible would be around operators. Um, you know, just to, cause like you said, maybe it's not ideal, but it is the state of the art right now. Right. They are Something. the workhorse of Kubernetes right now. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of people that probably have been trying to navigate them or are navigating them right now or have just navigated them and are figuring things out or are experts in them. And so I'd love to hear from you on that. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think that is, um, that is about all we have for today, unless you want to say anything special. I know there's um, a lot of smart people here with us. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to let us know in the chats, but let me get this link for the, the Slack. And I hope to see you all over there. I would love to hear all of your thoughts on how, <laughs> what you think of Patrick and his vision. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. That, that's kind of loaded. I'm in Slack, by the way. So if you have any, if you want to debate me, I'm over there. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah. I mean, all the public forums. <laughs> <laughs> also, he's not hard to miss. So yeah. And, and feel free to share different articles that you find interesting around these topics and where, how you feel like this could go or why we should drive this way instead of that way. Right. So now last question from me, uh, out of all of this, I mean, I remember when you said Amazon eventually caved because they saw the money in it. Is there any kind of money talk that you could potentially get us into? Like what would be the monetary benefit of this vision that you have for data on Kubernetes? Oh, this is, this is open source philosophy. Um, uh -huh. You know, creating islands is never a good growth strategy. You know, when you create scarcity, it creates um, it creates problems in your in any ability to, for any project to grow. Um, that's that's why you know working together, creating abundance is really important. And um, you know, this is why I'm a, been involved in open source since uh, I can even remember um, because I feel like the abundance is the important part. Wouldn't it be better? Like this is you know, a big part of what we do with Cassandra. I would, I, yeah, I work at DataStacks. It's great. They pay me a salary and we work on, he, they let me work on Cassandra, which is fantastic and do crazy things like this. But I'm more, I'm more interested in like, I would want everyone in the world to use Cassandra and, and, and love it. That, that's the abundance. And if they pay DataStacks or Amazon or some other company, great. But it's just, it, there's an abundance model that I think is really important for infrastructure, especially you know, how we build things. And this is a path to that. Very well put. I love it. So Patrick, thank you for coming on here and chatting with me. I really appreciate it. I think this is a perfect kickoff. And thank you everyone that is here with us and has been listening this whole time. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to reach out and let us know what you think. I will see you all next week. 
same place, same time, Tuesday at 9 a.m. California time, 5 p.m. London time. So see you all later. See you in the Slack. And again, thanks, Patrick. Thanks a lot, Demetrius.